Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures in the world of football talk about the first match they ever attended or indeed played in. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest, Chris Sutton. He probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it on anyway. Uh, started his career at Carrow Road, made the incredible successful transition from a centre-back to a centre-forward, becoming Norwich's leading scorer and also playing in the team that finished third in the inaugural Premier League season. Uh, Chris did move to Blackburn, where he just happened to pick up a Premier League title in his first season, alongside some guy called Shearer. Uh, he then had spells at Chelsea, not so good, and also at Celtic, very, very good. Since retiring from football in about 2007, Chris has made another very successful transition into the media. So you'll often see him at the weekend on Sky Sports, sparring with Chris Boyd. Uh, and you'll also hear him on Radio 5 Live as a co-commentator, a pundit, and of course, alongside Robbie Savage on 606. He's also written a couple of books. Um, the latest one uh, a few years ago, is your better than that? How to mix fix modern football, which actually was co-written by another guest on this show, Nigel Tassel. So, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you on board. And as the first ex-pro player we've had on the show today, we're going to focus a little bit also on the series of debuts that you've had during your player career. And the first thing I wanted to ask, and and I think I know the answer to this is. How fresh are your memories of all these games that you played in, the first game for Norwich, the first game for Blackburn? I, I get the feeling it might not be as fresh as some. Yeah, well, well, we'll uh, clearly find out, or I'll find out uh, today. First of all, thanks for thanks for having me on, uh, Richard. Yeah, so when, so when you got in touch initially, I was... I was thinking, you know, this this first thing will I will I be able to remember uh, that far back? But uh, I do remember uh, a lot of things from uh, from my uh, footballing career. There are things which I would like to forget uh, <laughs> from my from my footballing career. But in the in the end, you know, it it uh, you know my footballing career was what it was. I'm I'm very very proud of. Um, you know my 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 playing career and uh, and enjoying the work which I'm doing now in the media. Yeah, it's it's quite good fun, isn't it? Football media can can be unpleasant, but it's generally good. <laughs> yes. um, okay, let's let's just spin straight to your first ever appearance for Norwich, which uh, I believe was on the fourth of May, nineteen ninety one, when you came on as a sub for Robert Fleck in a in a game against Queen's Park Rangers. Let's say, okay, your memories might not be fresh, but is there something in there that you just remember coming onto the green grass and suddenly going, oh, I'm playing in a, you know, mm. a first division as it was game? Yes, well, um, what, what, what I do remember is I, uh, I made my Norwich City debut when I was still on a, a youth training scheme uh, contract, so uh, you know the old apprenticeship, I was actually released or rejected—not released, rejected from Norwich when I was twelve. Went on a yeah. trial, thought, oh, uh, you know, with that rejection, always wanted to be a footballer. Uh, then I thought it was the end of the world. I've got no chance of being a footballer. I used to actually uh, not—I preferred cricket, but um, you know, my dad was a. Huge influence on my career, a, uh, a a mad sports person. So I was lucky uh, that I had him as as uh, as my dad um, through my high school years. Enjoyed all different sports: football, cricket, basketball, table tennis, cross country. I didn't enjoy so much, uh, <laughs> although my dad sort of kicked me up the backside and made sure I did it. Um, and then when, uh, my GCSE year, I got, I did quite well in a, in a county cup competition. Uh, this was right at the end of the season, got asked down for a trial at, uh, at, at Norwich city from a scout who was watching the game. And right at the end of the season, they made a decision to, to take a chance on me uh, and gave us a two year YTS contract. 
So, um, you know, I'd gone from sort of nowhere playing at school. I'd actually gotten a job at Norfolk County Council in the in the meantime. I d- didn't didn't end up um, partaking in that job. Uh, that was as a clerk at uh, Norfolk County Council because Norwich City had offered me this uh, this youth training scheme um, contract, and then within that two year period, I'd come on and and made my debut. For the uh, for the first team, um, which was quite something, really, from where I'd come from, and you know, wasn't mm-hmm. part of any schoolboy system, to then go into the um, first team. Uh, Robert Fleck actually was very kind to me as a as a young player. He was, he was um, Scottish Glasgow Rangers player. Had come mm-hmm. down. He was the he was the go to guy for goals at Norwich at that particular time. And he was a really good influence, really positive influence uh, on me. So making my debut in the old first division, that was that was a pretty big deal. Absolutely. Uh, and Norwich's City game was Norfolk City Council's loss, I suppose. So, you know, I'm sure they're kicking themselves thinking, why why didn't we keep him? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, sh- I'm sure they're not. <laughs> um <laughs> talk me talk me through so as I say you came on as a sub then uh I believe your first actual um f- appearance in the starting lineup uh was actually against Crystal Palace the team I support in a three all draw is, is that correct do you do you remember that actually being in the starting lineup rather than coming on as a sub uh I I I can't actually really re- and that that was at the end of that season was it uh, it was where, the, where following the following no, season. The following season, ninety-two, yeah. ninety-three, yeah, 90, yeah. ninety-two. Oh, sorry, 93. ninety-one, ninety-two. 90, sorry, yeah. So the right, the yeah. last first division, yeah. Yeah, I, well, well, I remember uh, what what I do remember um, from that particular season and my early days at, at Norwich, and you mentioned it in the opener, um, was because I was versatile, I I could play centre half and centre forward. That actually was a massive string to my bow at that particular time because these were these weren't the big squads which Premier League teams have now. They were they were small mm-hmm. squads, and basically you do well in the youth team, you get your opportunity in the reserves. You do well in the reserves, and, and when I played in the reserves at that particular time, uh. The, the the standard um was really good in terms of a lot of first team players uh so pl- players like Paul Walsh I played against him as a youngster Vinny Samways uh Paul Davis uh you know those types of players so it was it was a pretty sort of quick learning curve you were playing against uh, people who had been there and and done it so that was a great grounding um for me, but as I say, I played centre half. I played centre forward, um, and uh, so when there was basically an injury in the first team, I could go in and and fit in um, in into those positions, and that was that was a great benefit to me really in in the early uh, stage of of my career. Sure, and it, you say it because of your versatility. You didn't find that transition too difficult because nowadays, I suppose it's very different nowadays, and you can't really imagine a centre half suddenly becoming a centre forward and a pretty good centre forward at that. It just, I, th- I think maybe people are channeled, the footballers are channeled into the positions possibly a little bit earlier. And as you say, you've got so mm-hmm. many players that you can have specialists in all sorts of positions who don't really ever think about doing another job on the field. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's interesting. Where there does seem to be a, a slight change in that. The 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 truth is, I'd never played as a centre half before. I went to uh, went to Norwich. I was in the early days. There was a uh, Norwich City's first team coach was a guy called David Williams, who was a, a really good player. David Williams was played for Bristol Rovers, came to Norwich City, um, and and had a massive influence on me. And I don't know whether it was because I was tall or whether whether David thought I could read the game. Well, whatever it was, anyway, I got tried out as a, a centre-half in a youth team game and then I progressed. Mike Walker, you'll remember Mike mm-hmm. Walker, who was the reserve team manager, threw me in. He had a a, a massive influence on, on my career. But what I used to... Um, 
what what I learned at that particular time uh, was of great benefit uh, to me playing the the different positions centre back and centre forward because um, I used to I used to play against mentioned um, you know excellent centre forwards I used to play mm-hmm. against ex- some excellent centre halves and I used to steal their ideas I used to what what particular players were good at I think well I'll think about implementing that into my game. And I found that as, you know, a, a real benefit. You know, certain Paul Walsh's movement was excellent. The timing of his runs, little things like uh, not want not wanting to run a channel too early and whatever. I learned I learned pretty quickly. I was I'm not saying I was necessarily switched on. Uh right, so I'm not gonna, you know, talk about myself in in those terms, but I did I I I think I, you know, I did take things in. I did absorb things and that was of great benefit to me especially in those uh, early stages and of course I made a, a lot of mistakes um as as young players do but that versatility um ended up being a you know a real strength for me absolutely and I think what you say there you know I'm actually now centre half because I'm so old I couldn't do anything but be a centre half <laughs> and get other young people to run around but I think if you play in that position for a while then you understand if you move to being a centre forward what would be most annoying what would be most effective mm. because you've got the vision of the centre half and what didn't you really want the centre forward to do and then you become a centre forward and go right I'll go and do that Absolutely. I'll push them nudge them do whatever uh, ever's needed to to put them off their game so yeah it's say so I can't really imagine many modern players doing this but uh, there were the odd one wasn't there when when I remember Kenny Burns I believe back in Kenny the day, Burns he, yeah he, well, I was a Nottingham changed. Forest fan, yeah. When I, when I was I was born there in Nottingham, go. but moved to Norfolk at a young age. Uh, but yeah, Kenny Burns from from uh, my era, Dion Dublin could, yes, could, of course, could, yeah. could do a bit. He was, you know, he had a a, a, a good footballing brain. Yeah, you don't. Uh, I don't know why that is. You don't see it as a uh, as you know as much now. But uh, no. I mean, I played in midfield for a season when I was at Celtic when the in the in the Champions oh, League. Really? So okay. I mean, yeah. Jack, you know what they say, Richard, jack of all trades. <laughs> we won't go any further into that one. Um, <laughs> going back to that first time when you say you came on a, as a sub for Robert Fleck, um, can you remember any of the players that you were playing with? I mean, there's interesting, I actually have the QPR lineup here, and it's quite interesting who played for QPR that day. So, mm-hmm. you, you know, Norwich were about to become or were becoming a very good side. And, you know, two years later, came third in the Premier League. Amazingly, when I checked my um, Premier League Nuggets book, they had, you had a m- minus four goal difference. and you That was because four. I was sent to half for most of that season, Richard. Oh, there, of course. Yes, there yes, you yes. go. So oh. what was incredible about that season... Uh, and I do remember this season very, very well. The the previous season, I think I was in and out of the team. Um, uh, but we, I think we'd stayed up by the skin of our teeth uh, the previous season. So we go into the yeah. inaugural Premier League season. I think we're favourites for relegation. Uh, we, we're yeah. certainly one of the favourites, if not the favourite for, um, for relegation, because we'd you know, we we we'd stayed up. I think we'd beaten Wimbledon. Oh, no, we'd drawn at home with Wimbledon. I remember. I, I don't think I played in that particular game. Um, and we, we'd drawn at home. That had kept Norwich City up. And mm-hmm. um, we go into the season. I think we lost every game in pre-season. And Mike Walker has stepped in and taken over from Dave yeah, Stringer, who was true. a you know yeah. Norwich legend, good manager. Mike was the reserve team manager. Stepped up. We've got Arsenal away, first game of the season at, uh, at Highbury, and this is a you know right good Arsenal team, uh, renowned weren't they for their for for, for their hard line defence? Uh, Adams, oh, yeah. Bold, uh, Dixon, Winterburn, David Seaman, who was a you know brilliant goalkeeper. Ian Wright was, I think, centre forward for Arsenal that day. 
and we get bat- absolutely battered in the first half. We're 2-0 down at half time. Uh, I played centre forward. I'd had a pretty yeah. good pre-season. Uh, but uh, Mike, had, or Norwich City, had signed a guy called Mark Robbins, who we all know, mm-hmm. Coventry City manager. Um, yeah. And Mike made an inspired substitution um, 15 minutes after half time or 20 minutes after yeah. half time. Brought on Mark Robbins, took me off. Mark yeah. Robbins scores a brilliant chip. We win the game yeah. 4-2. And then we're off and running. Uh, just... <laughs> We we were a strange team. We were pretty fearless, really. I don't think we sort of thought too much, but we had a goal in the team. We had a goal. Yeah. It, you know, we played good attacking football, but we did leak a lot of goals. And I played, I played a lot of that season as a uh, as a centre half, and we ended up f- finishing third, which was an amazing achievement. I don't think we ever actually believed. I can I I I can't ever remember us having a conversation about us possibly winning the Premier League. But that was a reality at one particular stage that season. I yeah. think we were leading over the Christmas period uh, right. and we were in a in a title race with Aston Villa and um, Ron Atkinson was the manager. So Alex Ferguson uh, was the uh, Manchester United manager. But blimey, do you know what? We weren't, we weren't far off. But having yeah. that, that negative goal difference, as you quite rightly say, that's pretty <laughs> amazing, isn't it? End up finishing third amazing. with a negative goal yeah. difference. So what happened then, Richard, is Mike Walker realised the error of his ways uh, yeah. and, and put me up front the next season. Yeah, and it went pretty pretty well, didn't it, the next season for you? Um, yeah, well, that was, yeah. So you uh, scored 25 goals, I believe, in the Premier League, which has never been emulated by any Norwich player and never got anywhere near it, I don't think, in terms of the Premier League. So, when you started playing as a centre forward, did we talked about the transition? You were versatile. You said it's not that big a deal, but did you get nervous, apprehensive? Oh my God! You know, I've got you know they're relying on me for goals now rather than stopping them. And did you get into a rhythm immediately because you know it's you're straight into it? You're into the Premier League. You got 38 games, or in then it would have been slightly more because it's a bigger division. Did can you remember just thinking, ah, I'm I'm a bit nervous about this. I'm not sure it's going to work. Or were you one of those confident, bullish, I'm going to do this type of guys? Um, I think at that particular time, uh, I you know. Came through the youth team, got a bit of confidence because I, you know, I had my first team debut and I was still a YTS player. I felt I was making strides. Did I used to get nervous in games? Yes, I did. But then I think, if I'm being if I'm being totally honest uh, with you, at that particular age, I was, I sort of uh, believed my own hype. In, in some respects, and became super, super sort of arrogant, cocksure of myself, uh, confident. I used to buy the newspapers when I was linked with, uh, you know, any particular club, lots of different clubs, yeah. and so sort of used to. I used to like all that stuff, and I, yeah, I, I, but I think that arrogance um, put me in good stead because I felt I was pretty sort of bullet. Proof and, and and confident when I played and would go out and I was lo- really lucky uh, to be part of a team. We had some excellent players. Uh, oh. A guy called Ian Crook was a was a wonderful midfield player. A guy you'll know very well. He used to smoke forty cigarettes a day. He couldn't run. He couldn't tackle. He couldn't head. But boy, could he pass! I mean, boy, could he pass! Um, wonderful player he, he was, and we had a little free kick. Uh, routine where uh, we'd make eye contact uh, he'd put his hand on the ball eye contact I'd, I'd make a little run peel off and he had the ability to to find me on you know a number of occasions he was that accurate a passer and I'd head oh. the ball in or volley it in and then run off and and take all the praise myself. Uh, <laughs> but I was lucky. I was really lucky. I played in a team with him, a guy called Rule Fox, who was, oh, you know, yeah. a big influence on my career as well. He was a really 
excellent player, right winger. He, he could play um, up top as well, would cut in, pass, follow, link up. Um, Mark Bowen, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of, I mean, and we were, we, you know, we were, we were an attacking team, and I, I love that period. It's a really, really, um, really, really good grounding. But in terms of where I was at, sort of mentally and my confidence, I, I, you know, I look back and I sort of cringe at some of the, some of the way, some of the things which I did, and and sort of the, the way I acted at, uh, you know, at times. But it was that that sort of arrogance which was a real good thing for me. At, at that mm-hmm. particular time, I'm not, you know, I'm not always sort of proud of uh, of sort of the way I was, but I was full of it, like a lot of, um, you know, young players are, and uh, and and certainly were at that particular time. It's uh, it's interesting the youth team environment, and as a young professional, because you're part of a club, but you're all scrapping like hell for contracts. So you're part of a team. You're going out on a Saturday, Tuesday. And uh, and you know you, you you're playing in the same team, you're wearing the same jersey, but you're you're you know you 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 you're fighting for for contracts and and to make that next step. So that's not that's not an easy environment to to navigate. And I I didn't find it easy. I didn't like it. So I just uh, you know essentially I just I sort of just became full of it really, and just just um, you know really backed myself. And I you know I was lucky to be in the the, uh, you know, a good team, but uh, I got on a run that particular um, season after the season we won the Premier League, the ninety three ninety four season, and I I would say my mindset at that stage was I was pretty fearless, didn't think I didn't think I'd miss opportunities, and that's uh, did didn't overthink things, and people may. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Not overthinking things now, underthinking. <laughs> uh, but but that was you know that 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 was important. That's sort of the mindset at, at, at that particular time to have that belief and uh, and confidence. I think yeah, as you're right, you have to have a base of confidence. You wouldn't get that far anyway if you didn't have some confidence in your own abilities. I did actually dip into your autobiography, which gave me some very amusing anecdotes about your younger times at Norwich, Mm. uh, including a famous occasion when uh, I think you had your leaving do, but you ended up in the police station. But we're not going to go into that (laughs) because we don't need to. That's not the reason for this podcast. I, I think Mike Walker also... Uh, in in that autobiography, I think you quote him as saying, "Chris didn't know how to keep his mouth shut." So that sort of plays to the slightly <laughs> cocky, arrogant player, but you do need yeah. it, and you know it's it's served you well. Clearly, going back, sorry, I'm always going to go back to that first game. So of the team you had around you, you had Jeremy Goss, who famously went on to, you know. Score yeah. against Bayern Munich, as we all know, and that famous victory, which which we can come on to later. You had Rule Fox, um, Dale Gordon actually scored the only goal of the game in that one, and and also right, Tim yeah. Sherwood, who went with yes. you to Blackburn, and then you know we we will talk about Blackburn in, in a minute. Um, but in the QPR side, you probably won't remember any of the opposition of the QPR side. But there was a certain mm-hmm. Ray Wilkins. Ray Wilkins, yeah, yeah. There, there you go. go. Yeah. Thirty-five uh, so... years old. When you were, put, you know, you came on as a sub. Did you think, oh my word, I'm on the same pitch as Ray Wilkins? This incredible England international, lovely bloke, and just generally, you know, a fantastic player. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, I I remember. Uh, the the last YTS year, but I, it's, uh, I've mentioned the reserve league and, and playing mm. against uh, top professionals. Really, I remember coming on yeah. in a game uh, at Anfield. I can't remember whether it was Paul Blades, the centre half, or Ian Butterworth who pulled a hamstring, and coming on and playing against Ian Rush as a centre half. Yeah. And and <laughs> remember, I um, you know, asking to manager asking me to come on at half time and thinking oh god I'm playing against Ian Rush but then once you're out there and you're playing you think well this isn't too bad really so you so I, you know I always took great confidence from the fact that you know albeit there was that 
certainly there was a fear factor when you, know, you mentioned Ray Wilkins. He was a, he was a brilliant, brilliant player, wonderful player, and so there's the there's the awe factor in some respects. But then it's you know you've got a job to do. Um, you know, I really wanted to establish myself, and they they are they aren't sort of pinch me moments. And you know, I always go back to because I wasn't part of any any uh, schoolboy system because of my rejection. It all happened in such a short space of time. I've come from nowhere, and all of a sudden into Norwich's first team, into playing, uh, you know, against international players. That that was oh. that was pretty amazing. But then there is that. There's that desperation to just, uh, you know, you get you get a you get a taste of it, a taste of the action, a feel of it, playing in front of big crowds, um, and naturally you just want more. It's you know, it's it, it it's adrenaline, and I used to you know absolutely love love those days, and um, you know, so really I felt really lucky, and I. At the end of my career, uh, you know, time to really look back and reflect. I was really lucky to uh, to be brought up in that in that Norwich team at that at that particular time. Yeah, because you know we say they were on the rise, and also you know you talk about reserve team football doesn't really happen anymore because you were up against you know real men and you know real football. Whereas mm -hmm. now it doesn't really happen. You've got academies all point. the way up, but age groups. But you don't come up against Paul Walsh or Billy Samways until you you make it to the first team, and and as we know, that's so, interesting. Sorry, that Richard, but because um, I think that you know nowadays they have the sort of the twenty ones, twenty threes, whatever it is, football clubs do. But I always thought that you know if you're if you're judging a player, it's easy to judge a player if they are playing against a professional player who's been there and done it over a period of time i think you know nowadays how do you how do you you know judge the sort of 21s and you know yeah. whatever uh i i always thought that was a, that was a brilliant grounding because you have to learn and learn really fast you know you you, you i remember playing in reserve the early part of my reserve team days and and making mistake after mistake, but you know it's, it's essentially a, you know a sort of life skill in many ways. You have to find a way to to survive and improve and switch on. And um, I always thought that I was that was that was one of my sort of strengths, really, um, mm. in terms of you know being relatively switched on and and, uh, a, a, and understanding what my strengths were. Uh, and trying desperately to hide my weaknesses. Yeah, it's it's sort of it's a cliche, but it's it's a bit of a school of hard knocks. So you you mm. know to survive that process, you have to be pretty good, and then you can take it in to if you get the chance to become part of the first team, you've got that already that experience, so you can then move on. Whereas now, the gulf, as you say, is enormous, and academy players going into the first team, although we can think of many examples currently of players who've done incredibly well just going from academy into first team. So, mm. you know, that there are different different ties. Uh, I was going to ask you, can you remember your first goal for Norwich? I've got it down here, but you may not be able to remember it. Well, I, was, I, I think I came off the bench. Um, I think that we were 2-1 down, and I think I, I, I may be right. I think I scored the winning goal in... In injury time, yeah, off my yeah. shin from oh. a yard. It's all part of the body. It's all part That's of the body. Uh, yeah, and that was that was a theme throughout my career. That type of goal, <laughs> a very a very effective shin, shin <laughs> Sutton. They should have called you, shouldn't they? Really? <laughs> and that was against Co Coventry, I believe. Uh, mm. As you say, you came on as a sub in November '91, so the following season. Uh, and that first Premier League appearance, I mean, come on, 2 nil down away at Arsenal. And as you say, you're getting battered. And was there a part of you thinking, you know, we, we, we were going to go back to this thing where you're competing with players. So you get pulled off, you're 2 nil down, you think, well, this game is gone. Mark Robbins comes on, gets a brace. 
you end up winning 4-2 and you're thinking, oh, yes. <laughs> am, am yeah, I yeah, going to get yeah. back in here? Is <laughs> it, was there any element of thinking, I don't really want him to score any more lovely goals? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really you know good good point you make there. Uh yeah, I mean, you know, you 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 you're, you're vying for positions, aren't you? But that was the beauty of of being versatile for me because that I predominantly played that season as a centre half, so that that mm-hmm. that worked out well in the end. Uh, but I, I I was never in a position. I understood pecking orders pretty well throughout my career. I knew I knew where I was. I knew players who were uh, were better than me. Mark Robbins was a uh, a brilliant finisher, different different type. Of player, but when you're when you're a young player, in fact, not just when when you're young, but you have to uh, you have to establish yourself, and uh, that that's you know that that was all part of the upbringing at uh, at Norwich. Little things like from the from the youth team days going into uh, going into uh, pre season, uh, and we used to run around the the University of East Anglia, mm-hmm. and uh, the uh, the youth team coach and the reserve team coach, Mike Walker, at that particular time, saying, you know, making sure that uh, you don't you don't let a first team player finish in front of you. You always you always finish in front of them. You know, they've earned the yeah. right to actually get there. You've got to earn the right. And I and, and I like I like that at that particular time that that sort of mentality that you know about earning the right. And my dad was always my dad was a a, a former player and he was very yeah. influential. Uh, with stuff like that, and I, I, you know, I like that basic principle, and you know, uh, I, I like the old apprenticeship days, cleaning boots. You mentioned Tim Sherwood. I used to clean his boots, and Ian Butterworth, uh, and Paul Blades. I didn't like picking the kit up after uh, after they'd been out training and their dirty slips. Uh, and whatever I, I wasn't I wasn't a great fan of uh, of scrubbing the showers and uh, and what have you. But I did I did like that as as part of the the, the learning curve. And you, you, what I also liked, which is different nowadays, is academies and you know Premier League football clubs. I think they're a lot of them. I don't know whether it's the case with all of them. They're they're away from the first team. We were always in and around. The first team making them cups of tea, going down to a local bakery and and getting them sausage rolls and uh, you know the first team players sausage rolls in the morning. I think the diet the dietary sort of situation has changed within football, but that was all all part of the the you know the the, the learning process. And uh, I, I've got to say, I absolutely really enjoyed it. You want you strive to. To get there and uh, and become a first team player, but it's about it's about earning it. Absolutely, and you're right. There is, I mean, I go to quite a few training grounds in my time, and there's such a separation between the academy and the first team. I mean, they might be on the same site, but they might as well be a hundred miles away because mm. there's no, you know, they don't eat together, they don't mix together. It's just, you know, that's the first team. Here's the academy, and never the twain shall meet, which seems. A real shame, and and I think it's something that has been lost at a lot of clubs. So- I agree with that. Do you know what? It was absolutely golden for me to have Robert Fleck, Norwich City yeah. centre forward. Uh, you know, brilliant goal scorer. Um, you know, for him to to you know have a word or two, or you know, speak to you and. You know Brian Gunn, players I've you know really looked up to, just taking time, just a little quip. You think, blimey, you know you you mm. feel sort of special with it. It's you know really a, you know a, a big big part of my upbringing, a good part of it. Yeah, and when you became a first team player, and other people were picking up your dirty uh, shorts or whatever it was, be did you? Think well. I was there quite recently, so I'm going to be, you know, nice and gentle to them. We say, "Oh, go on, clean that, get on with it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I was, I was pretty reasonable, especially the old, okay. the older I got. I mean, you know, a lot of the uh, when I was at Celtic, a lot of the there are a lot of sort of anecdotes which uh, 
which which are sort of flying around uh, uh, and mm -hmm. these stories grow arms and legs from uh, from <laughs> from some of the youth team players Sean Maloney Aidan McGeady oh, yeah, uh, yeah, Charlie yeah. Mulgrew play but I, I I used to because of, of my upbringing at Norwich I used to I uh, you know I used to value uh, sort of when you know when I was at Celtic and these young players and uh, and sort of getting stuck into them in a nice cajoling mm -hmm. in a you know yeah. in a nice way. So I, I, you know, I used to like all that sort of chat and uh, and banter with the with the younger players. Yeah, yeah. So as we were talking about Norwich were on the up, uh, came third in the inaugural Premier League, and then um, can you remember your first European match? Because you you had quite a few under your belt by the time you'd finished your career. Do you remember your first one, which was for Norwich? Yeah, well, that must have been Vitus Arnhem. Uh, right. And that must have been well. I, I, we beat them three nil. I remember Efenakuku right. scoring a brilliant, uh, a brilliant, as a volley off from from the right hand side of the area, and that that were. I mean, that was incredible, really. I mean, that whole that whole period, and then we went away to Vitus Arnhem, and that's when I actually I started to. Um, I mean, everybody talks about tactics uh, nowadays and how the game has evolved, and you know, sort of. I suppose making out that uh, in in uh, sort of the early part of the Premier League, we didn't have tactics, but but going away in Europe was when I I, I used to have to drop in in behind Efren Akuku was a you know really effective player, very very good he was. He was so quick. I loved playing with him. Because I would be the sort of focal point, flick things on, get the ball on my chest, hook it into an area. FM was so quick, was so quick he would get there. He was one of those players, he never looked like he was actually he was actually straining when he was running. He just used to glide. And uh, I love loved my partnership with him. And we went away to Vitas Arnhem. He missed qu quite a few chances, but I sort of played in a withdrawn role and, uh, and we drew nil-nil over there. Um, but you know the home game was special, and of course, uh, going through that, that uh, you know, got us up against Bayern Munich in probably the most famous game in Norwich City's history. I would, I would say. Well, I think it would have to be because you became the first British team to beat Bayern Munich at home. I think you mm. remain the only English team to beat them in the old state. So it was the Olympia Stadion not the Alliance yeah. Arena it is now. So I think, because that, I think they changed about 2005. So, you know, you've got that feather in your cap. And that's one of the, it's one of the things I wanted to ask you. When those sort of landmark things are achieved, is that something you think about a lot as a player or you just put it away and you might come back to it later? Or is there something, you know, is there a buzz in the dressing room saying, you know what we've done here? Um, how, how did you, was it so impactful for fans? I think it's always mm. something they go on about. I, I'm just interested if the players get the same enjoyment and enthusiasm and elation as the fans would. Do you know what, Richard? Uh, I thought it was normal, mm. and uh, as, as as you know, I finished. <laughs> it's been finished a long time. Anything but normal. But I, I, I thought it was normal. Was it a great surprise, Norwich City beating Bayern Munich, uh, that particular Norwich City team? To, to most people on the face of it, uh, yes. To us as players, and this might sound ridiculous, we knew we were good. <laughs> we knew we had a good team. Yeah. We, knew we, could, we knew we could carry a threat, right? Mm -hmm. But we also knew on the flip side of that, if we if we were a little bit off it, then we could get absolutely hammered. So um I mean that that was. I mean, we had a get together six weeks, two months ago, I actually haven't haven't seen a lot of the guys for oh, the best part of the yeah. thirty years. And, you know, yeah. the time has, has has flown. But that that was a, you know, special, special game, the Goss Folly and then Bowen, you know, you we we're two <laughs> <laughs> up in the Olympic Stadium, and you're thinking this is this is madness. But we had we actually, you know, you talk about tactics, and I haven't seen this formation actually uh, since we played three centre halves, 
and we had a okay. sweeper. Oh, Three centre halves yeah. and a sweeper okay. and wing backs because we were, you know, we were conceding a lot of goals. But we, uh, you know, we we were good, we were a good attacking team. Believe it or not, that that sounds like we're quite defensive, but we could break. But Crook could pass. Jeremy Goss had an iron lung. You know, Rule Fox could get us up the pitch. Bowen would 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 maraud forward. Such a clever player, Mark Bowen. Little give and goes, and his understanding with uh, with Crook, who had um, eyes in the back of his head. You know, and then you know there was myself, there was uh, Mark Robbins, uh, there was Effina Cuckoo. So you know, we were we were quite a capable team, and and you know, and and we knew that. Do you know what? Uh, and everybody talks about that game, but in many ways. In many ways, what was more impressive was that was half time. Mm. Bayern Munich still had to come back to Carrow Road, and uh, yeah. and they came back to Carrow Road, and they scored after five minutes. But we we were brilliant on that particular night. We ended up drawing one one. Jeremy Goss scored. Um, I think it was in the second half, and uh, we played with such control and maturity. I remember Lothar Mateus at the end of the game chucking down his shirt and uh, he was a bad sport. He was a bad loser. You know, it's humiliating oh. for them to be beaten by little Norwich City. Uh, but yeah. that that was, that in many ways was uh, a bigger deal, I felt, because you can win a one-off game you know, you can win a one-off game, you can beat Bayern Munich, but you have to back it up. So for us to do that, you know, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have felt like it does all these years on had we gone out in the second leg yeah. and, and and lost at home. So that was that was another special night and probably the best atmosphere when I was at the the um the Norwich Ipswich game at the weekend. It was a good atmosphere. But I would say that <laughs> that 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 night on, uh, against Bayern Munich was in terms of Norwich City atmospheres surpasses anything which which I can remember. And that that comes brings us to another point about the connection with the crowd. And because you know, let's face it, in your career you played in front of some big crowds. It, does it become almost you become blase about that? So, oh, here's another forty thousand. You know, we'll just get on with it. It's a game. It's a job. Or is there still if if it's you know, a febrile atmosphere or whatever you want to call it, does it still get you, even though you might be into your career and, you know, getting towards the end of your career? I mean, Celtic clearly is a fantastic atmosphere most of the time. But did it still strike you as a player, whoa, the fans are really up for this. We need to deliver almost. Yeah, and uh, you know, pre uh, you know, it comes down to a lot of things, doesn't it? It comes down to uh, expectation, and I suppose at that particular period, though, I mean, you know, let's let, let, let's get it uh, right. Norwich City aren't Manchester United, but there was a, a certain expectation. It was, it was sad. It was sad the way it all it all happened so quickly. Norwich's rise at the uh, you know, in the inaugural Premier League season, because I've spoken about the previous season uh, where things didn't go well and, you know, we we're basically favourites for relegation. And then the third place finish, then into Europe, uh, the Bayern Munich, and we ran into Milan close. Uh, but then then come the, the, comes the scrutiny on the, the chairman was a guy called Robert Chase at that particular time. And... Uh, yeah. And then you know Norwich need to. His phrase was loosen the purse strings um, at that particular time, um, and he was. I mean, you, you know, Norwich City fans were pretty much split on on him. But as is the case, you know, they wanted not, uh, you know him to spend more money and to try and drive the club forward because we were in a good place. But it's not. It's not that easy. Uh, you know, yeah. it never was going to be that easy for a club of of, of Norwich City side as size. And then Mike Walker ended up leaving, uh, and then they sold Rule Fox to um, Kevin Keegan's Newcastle, and yeah. that was when I thought, uh, you know, I, the, I, you know, I, I, I want out at that particular time. I, uh, I, I loved Mike Walker. I thought he was a you know really good manager, really big influence on my on my career, and I could have just about. 
coped with him going, but when they sold Royal Fox, that was that was sort of he was my mate and uh, good player, bit of a bit of a sickness, lack of ambition, and uh, that's when I thought, well, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Norfolk boy. I wasn't born in Norfolk. I was brought up, uh, you know, Norfolk. I count myself as a as a Norfolk boy, but I, you know. And we don't like we don't like leaving the county, but that was that was the time when I thought I, you know, I I, I need to move on. Yeah, and then you became the most expensive British player at the time with a five million pound move to Blackburn Rovers and Jack Walker. But I've read also that one of the big influences for you, because you you had quite a few clubs after you, was Kenny Dalglish. So your first meeting with Kenny Dalglish, is that something you can remember because you were probably in awe of him as a player and he clearly was mm. becoming, you know, a manager at that time, but he didn't have a huge pedigree as a manager. So was there that moment where you went, oh my, I'm in front of Kenny Dalglish, this is, you know, a big moment in my life? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's quite quite funny that because I, I'm I'm in awe of the... The generation, you know, that generation of uh, mm -hmm. of player, and you know, Kenny Dalglish was. I mean, you didn't have to support uh, Liverpool to admire what a, an absolute genius uh, he was. So, and believe it or not, uh, Richard, I'm quite a sort of shy guy at times. So, you know, he <laughs> no, I easily, believe you, Chris. I believe easily, you. easily intimidated, and, and you wow. know, is. You know, he's only a little guy, Kenny Dalglish, but mm. blimey, he's as uh, he's as sharp as a tack he is. And you know, his reputation uh, went before him as a uh, as a player, but he was highly intelligent as a manager. I so my uh, my first, well, he he called me uh, and like talked to me on 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 numerous occasions about signing, and then I had the altercation the night before I signed and ended up in a in a police cell. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, I was thinking, happens, I'd, 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 I'd already signed by then. Actually, mm. I don't know whether you know the story about me signing, uh, no. but 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 the the chairman Robert Chase had said that uh, on that particular season, because it was all kicking off, Mike Walker had gone, Real Fox had gone. He, he said, if Chris Sutton isn't there at the um, at the start of next season, then I won't be here as chairman. Uh, yeah. So, so then he he sort of got in reverse. Uh, the longer the season went on, and we'd had discussions, I said I wanted to leave. Uh, and I'd gone and I'd signed. I'd, I'd travelled to Blackburn and I'd gone to Robert Cor, the chairman's house. Um, lived in a place called Ribchester. I think I'd gone to his house. The secretary, uh, John Howarth, I think his name was, was there. I signed the contract. It was all hush hush. Uh, a few days later, I uh, go into a press conference with Robert Chase at Norwich City. I've already signed for Blackburn. Robert Chase says that we're going to um, we're going to test the water if if clubs uh, if there's a club out there who's willing to pay a British record transfer fee of five million pounds, then we will sell Chris. And I'd I'd already signed for for Blackburn, so I you know. I, <laughs> It was an How odd did you moment. handle? Did you sort of go, "Oh my, what's he doing?" Or did you manage? Well, I just, to I just, I just, I just did what I was told and um, and and shut up. Uh, so, and to be fair, <laughs> no, I mean it was, you know, I, 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 I could have gone, I could have gone, you know, anywhere at that particular time. Um, there are a lot of clubs in for me, but I, I. Uh, Blackburn were the club who did they'd run Manchester United really close. I yeah. I have to say I didn't know a, a a great deal about the North at that particular time, other than okay. without trying to upset Northerners, the running joke was it always rains uh, up north. <laughs> yeah. And uh don't know whether it's a joke or you know, there's there's large ele elements of of truth uh, in that. Mm. But uh I, you know, moved to Blackburn and I, I, I absolutely loved it there. I had five Brilliant years. I love the area where I live. I know a lot of players, you know, they play for Blackburn, Burnley, live in Manchester. Mm -hmm. um, I used to live in a place called the Ribble Valley. It was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, 
few miles from a town called Clitheroe and uh and the yeah. the people were nice uh you know very straight spade yeah. call a spade a spade and I, no, I like yeah. you know really like my time up there and you know to be part of that whole team Kenny Dalglish yeah. Ray Harford was his coach and mm-hmm. we were we were we were a young team uh and you know I suppose if you were going to compare it to uh, a model or a type of model, you might say that we would have been a bit of a a Chelsea model uh, a d- development. You know, Jack Walker mm-hmm. was was buying the best sort of young players around at that particular time. But unlike yeah. the sort of Chelsea team, we were uh, we were far more streetwise, and you know, Shearer was at the at the front and uh, and centre of all that. I mean, he was he was phenomenal. We were we were we weren't the greatest football team the Premier League has ever seen in terms of playing the beautiful game, but we were mm. mightily good at what we did. We were effective, and uh, and we knew how to win games. And that's you know, of course, uh, you know there there are different ways to skin a cat, and and we were uh, you know really really effective at what we did. Mm. I, I think it's interesting you say that, you know, you moved from Norwich and no one ever leaves Norfolk easily, but you're moving to Blackburn, which is, you know, a relatively small town, you know, in the greater Manchester area, but you're living possibly in something that's not dissimilar to Norfolk, as in quite a lot of green, generally, mm. Um you're not living in a city, basically. So it, it's a bit more of it. It's a bit easier to move from somewhere, you know, which is your rural to another rural area rather than going into, you know, the urban life. Mm. Um, so do you remember, for example, your first game for Blackburn? Did you think, wow, this yep. is really different? This is this is so odd, you know, compared to what I have got used to at Norwich. Um. Well, I mean, you know, I was part of a pretty successful Norwich team, but it was, you know, it was yeah. different. My first game, my first game, actually, my first ever game for Blackburn was against a Norwegian team called Steinke. And I've gone okay. from Norwich City, where uh, you've got a good journalistic brain, so I'll, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. So I've oh, gone from gosh. Norwich City, uh, where I could do no wrong, because Norwich City aren't expected to mm-hmm. beat Manchester United, Liverpool, Bayern Munich. Inter Milan, uh, so everything was positive about me. Uh, yeah, everything I read was positive, and all of a sudden, flick a switch, you go for a British record transfer fee, and then there are elements of people questioning, uh, you know, is he worth the money, and uh, sort of really scrutinising my you know, my game and, and what have you. And that, that, you know, I learned that that, that comes with the, with the, uh, with the territory. I didn't, I didn't like the sort of some of the negativity who would like that. Um, and then, so, so my first, so I'm getting there. So the first right. game was against a Norwegian team called Steinke. I didn't score. And the headline right. on the back of the newspaper. Sutton uh, had Steinke. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Richard. And I thought, well, that's you know, that's, that's slightly harsh. Probably true. Uh, well, but no, yeah. it, it was just just that that just that whole change. And then we, um, yeah, you know, learned throughout my career. You, you you know, you go for big money. You've got to you got to score goals. I didn't score in the first game. We drew away at Southampton. I think mm-hmm. Alan scored uh, that. We should have won the game. But then I scored on my home debut against Leicester. That and that was that was pretty big and then I, I I went on a good run before uh before the Christmas period uh of goals has got a hat trick against Coventry City and we as a team we were absolutely flying uh at, oh. at the start of the season. I remember just going into games uh expecting to blow anybody away, especially at home. Um, you know we yeah. we had we had wingers who were like Trojans. They they worked and worked Ripley Wilcox uh, Sherwood was a really clever player. I always felt Tim Sherwood was was an underrated player. I thought he was a really intelligent footballer. A guy called Mark Atkins uh, oh, yeah, played him. in played predominantly that season in midfield because David Batty had a had a 
it had a serious ankle injury. He came in before the end of the season. And I'm going in reverse here, aren't I, the team? And then we had Henningberg, sort of not a marauding right back, but very dependable, no. uh, good player he was. Uh, Colin Hendry, all action. Yeah. Um, you know, used to just absolutely fearless, brave heart, used to just throw himself in the way of anything. Mm. I actually tried in that title winning season actually tried to make a tackle with his head when he was on the ground uh, <laughs> in, a, in a skirmish at, uh, right. at at Everton. And then Tony Gale played the first half of the season, oh, uh, yeah, essentially. Yeah. Uh, I used to room with Tony. Um, so the yeah. old stager had come in from West Ham. Good footballer Tony was. Um, yeah. And then Ian Pearce, uh, who was more athletic than, mm -hmm. um, than, than Tony, but... Uh, yeah, so he played the second half of the season. He was a good footballer, and then Graham Lasso was the was the left back, and Tim Flowers uh, was in goal. So we, you know, we had a we had a good team, good squad. Yeah. So as you say, you, you got off to a flyer, and you kept it going. And you know, the famous last game at Anfield when you know Liverpool fans probably were quite pleased in the end because Man United got pit by by themselves. At what stage of that season did you think actually we're we're in for the title here? Because Blackburn hadn't won, you know, a top tier title for mm. a very long time, and and this was, you know, again under Jack Walker's tutelage. You know, money was coming in, as you said, by good young players. But was was there a, a sort of a, a light bulb moment when you think actually we're we're serious contenders here, or did it just develop? evolve gradually yeah we knew we were contenders because of you know how ruthless we were and you know especially the early part of the season and you know it was us and us and manchester united mm. and they'd had a couple of refereeing decisions go their way in a head-to-head -head games which um amazing you know, which uh yeah uh <laughs> so but they they were they you know they were a team and they that was was where all that era, the you know the late goals, the Fergie time, and they that you know they were an amazing team, and this was just the start of it, really. Under yeah. you know under under Sir Alex, that you know they won the ninety two ninety three the inaugural season, and they were, you know they were they were pretty relentless. So you know looking back, it was a it was a pretty big deal Blackburn getting over the line. We did it on the last day at Liverpool, didn't we? When everybody. Yeah basically thought Liverpool were going to throw the game because of the Kenny connection. That, yeah. You know, it was never ever going to be the case. But then I still I still watch clips on Sky of that West Ham Manchester United game and McCloskey, the West Ham got yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pulling off save after save. Yeah, blimey. Yeah. But you know, 42 game season. Uh the last of the 42 game seasons. Mm. That was a, a big, big deal. Big big deal. You look where Blackburn are now as a club, and it's you know it's yeah. heartbreaking in a way. And you know you you also look at a lot of clubs who were big clubs then who are no longer at the prime, and and they're you know yeah. it's very sad to see them drift away. 